Nous allons commencer la conférence. We're starting the conference. Change the system of the climate. Changer le système pas climat. Alors, je vais demander d'abord à Madame Stephanie Hemsen, la co-directrice de la Fondation Rosa Luxembourg, bureau de New York, de venir nous dire quelques mots. Stephanie, please. And I'd like to welcome you to the concluding event of today's climate space that was co-convened by Alternatives and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. As many of you hopefully know, we have a number of events today with great speakers that reflect the globally diverse movement. And now I'm especially happy to welcome you to this panel on change the system, not the climate. Before I turn back to Roger Rashi, who will introduce our distinguished panelists and who will facilitate the discussion, let me briefly point out why I think the topic of climate change is at the core of the process of the World Social Forum. First of all, climate change is a truly global issue. It cannot be contained within borders. This means We have to cooperate globally in order to fight climate change. Secondly, climate change can no longer be considered a problem of the future. It already affects us today by causing massive human suffering. Rising temperatures and sea levels emphasize the urgency of the issue, reminding us that we cannot wait, but that we have to act now. Thirdly, climate change has tremendous social impact. We all know that its effects are most heavily felt by poor people, particularly by indigenous peoples and peoples of, people of color. These frontline communities are also in the forefront of the battle against the fossil fuel industries, fighting the neoliberal, environmentally destructive agenda. I think our task is clear. We need to create one big movement that fights the powers that be. We need to create a movement of movements, bringing together activists from the indigenous communities, communities of color, environmental organizations, progressive political parties, trade unions and the labor movements, and other progressive activists. In short, that means we need to discuss strategy, which is exactly what we are going to do with this panel. Without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Roger, and I want to thank our panelists and our partner, Alternatives, for making this happen. Thank you. Merci, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. And I'm particularly happy and honored to facilitate this meeting. The most difficult task that was given to me tonight was introducing Naomi Klein. What can I say about Naomi that hasn't been said? So of course, her great book, No Logo, of course, the great book, The Shock Doctrine, and of course, her latest book, which I think is by far the best of all her work, but there's more works to come. This changes everything. The lead manifesto, I was very honored when Naomi invited me and my organization to join in the conference that preceded the publication of the lead manifesto. And that document, I think of all the public documents that have been, that have been put out in Canada in the past 20 years, has had the most impact. Alors, j'ai tenté, à la mesure de mes moyens, de présenter Naomi, mais j'aimerais lui dire quelque chose en français. D'abord, Naomi, bienvenue à Montréal. Bienvenue chez toi. Bienvenue à la maison. Alors, recevons Naomi Klein. Je vous prie. Yes. 
Merci Roger. Bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde. Um, we are on indigenous land, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people and the Algonquin people. Um, those of you from outside Canada, I want to extend an especially warm welcome. Sorry, I'm just timing myself. I'm not texting. Um, <laughs> Somewhere out there, Abby is cringing. Um, so those of you who traveled great distances to be here, welcome. Uh, those of you who had wanted to attend the forum as participants, as speakers, who were registered but denied visas by the Canadian government, you are deeply missed. World Social Forum in Porto Alegre 15 years ago. And now I've been to the first First World Social Forum because this is not a World Social Forum. Not when 70% of the people from the Global South who applied for visas were denied visas. Canada, I'm afraid, is not as seen on TV. Not everybody gets greeted at the airport by a shirtless Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Oiled up, like that guy from the Congo in the Olympic opening ceremony, yet not as seen on TV. Apparently, the Canadian government was worried that the World Social Forum delegates would overstay their visas. Never mind that the, the, the delegates applying for those visas from places like Mali and Palestine and Ecuador are the last people likely to overstay their visas and try to move to Canada. These are political leaders and community organizers of the first order intensely committed to changing their homelands. That commitment is what unites so many people who are here. The tourists from the US, on the other hand, these are the ones vowing to move to Canada if Donald Trump is elected. <laughs> Now, I shouldn't joke about this because this is something that I actually know a little bit about. I was born in this city in 1970 because my father, a U.S. citizen, did not want to be a soldier in the Vietnam War. Je suis née dans cette ville en 1970 parce que mon père, un citoyen des États-Unis, ne voulait pas être un soldat dans la guerre de Vietnam. Under Justin Trudeau's father, my parents were waved through the border and were free to stay and build their lives here. But Canada is not like that today. In fact, there are dozens of US soldiers and veterans who have fled to Canada over the past 12 years because they refused to fight an, an, an illegal war in Iraq. And here, they have faced deportation, legal harassment, and live in limbo, constantly afraid that they will be deported and jailed in the United States. It began under our last government but nothing has changed so far for Iraq war resistors. And let me state the obvious. These men and women are heroes. They stood up to the most powerful military force on earth, refusing to be complicit in war crimes, refusing to fight a war for oil, which has a little to do with climate change, our topic tonight. These issues are all interconnected. government claims it is working to change the situation, but so far, like so much else with this government, it's only words. Justin Trudeau, not as seen in viral videos. A digression, perhaps, but it's an important reminder of how much easier it is to change a country's image than it is to change its policies. How much more comfortable neoliberal politicians are with progressive marketing and small, largely symbolic steps than with the substantive work of system change. But nothing less than system change will allow us to do what's necessary to avert catastrophic warming in the short time that remains. And because we live in a time when politics is treated as a spectator sport, it's always important to remember that our fragile atmosphere is utterly indifferent to cheering and hugging politicians at international summits. Same goes for small steps in the right direction, which we're always told we should accept, and that's all we are allowed to demand. 
All that matters is now how much carbon is allowed to accumulate year on year. The rest is just noise. Some of you will recall that Canada made quite an impression during the Paris Climate Summit last December. Canada stood with some of the most vulnerable countries in the world and argued that the temperature target in the agreement should not be to keep warming below uh, 2 degrees Celsius, but that it should be 1.5. And we got some of that language in the agreement. That was a proud moment for Canada. And Justin Trudeau said, Canada is back. Remember that? <laughs> and that's true. Back to the same old tricks. Trudeau and his ministers returned home and joined with the Alberta government to push new tar sands pipelines like Energy East that would endanger water systems in this province and in this very city. That mega pipeline, that $16 billion pipeline is utterly incompatible with the temperature targets that we ourselves championed because it is linked to massive expansion of one of the dirtiest sources of carbon on the planet, the Alberta tar sands. And scientists have told us that if we're serious about two degrees, 80% of it has to stay in the ground, more for 1.5. Our government did this for a simple reason. They may want to do the right thing when it comes to climate, I have no doubt that they do. But when it comes to economics, it is still locked within a logic that, sees economic, that seeks economic growth at all costs and is terrified of real industrial planning or, God forbid, advocating reduced consumption among wealthy over-consumers. So, Canadians are asked to live with the cognitive dissonance of saying one thing to the world and doing precisely the opposite at home. In truth, this is familiar territory. Canada is founded on broken treaties as any indigenous person on Turtle Island. Breaking our sacred word is a national tradition. It's heritage, and it will continue unless we as social movements band together and stop it inside Canada and around the world, particularly those movements in nations that are most impacted by climate change, and this is a movement that must be led by indigenous people in this country. That, perhaps it seems I'm being overly hard on the Trudeau government. It's much better than the last gang with their permanent snarl. This government's unofficial slogan, those of you who are from out of town, is sunny ways. Well, we need more than sunny ways. We need solar power, and we need it everywhere, with that power generation owned in common by communities and not by private players. But, of course, to do that, we would need to break all the rules in the neoliberal playbook, and that's why this discussion is about the need for system change if we are going to be serious about climate change. We need to stand up to those fossil fuel giants and the banks that fund them, we need to take back our energy grids from private players. We need to embrace our right to plan our economies. And we must wage war on the logic of austerity, which is itself at war with life on Earth. There are more ways that climate change highlights the need for system change. And our wonderful panelists tonight are going to be getting into more detail. One, another example, all this green talk in the world doesn't matter if our governments keep pushing trade deals like the TPP, TTIP, and CETA, which allow corporations to sue our governments when they do do the right thing and stand up to multinational corporations. You know, TransCanada currently is suing the U.S. government for saying no to the Keystone XL pipeline. They want $15 billion in damages. Um, Quebec provided uh, an early warning for all of this because Quebec was one of the first regions in the world to pass a fracking moratorium. Um, it was a historic movement-led victory and it inspired people around the world. But there is a gas company, pretending actually to be a US gas company, that is using NAFTA to challenge uh, the Quebec fracking ban. Uh, is seeking damages. It claims that it violates its right to frack for gas under the St. Lawrence. So these are a few of the ways that climate change changes everything. It changes it because our current economic and political system blocks meaningful climate action at every turn, which means that system change 
is a matter of survival. Trudeau is a good student. He studied Obama. He knows how to look cool while selling arms to repressive regimes and peddling job-killing trade deals. He thinks we're going to be satisfied with parades and weekly viewings of his packs. <laughs> no matter how grave the problem, the war waged on the bodies of indigenous women, indefinite detention of migrants, the climate crisis, the water crisis, the solution is always the same, consultation, further study, inquiry. Meaningful action is always off in the distance. Words and pictures, words and pictures. Mot et des images, mot et des images. Well, someone needs to tell our selfie-loving PM that we are up against the wall. And words and pictures aren't going to cut it because this, this moment in our history, this is the era of the deed. Ceci est l'ère de l'action. When it comes to climate change, that means doing whatever it takes to bring down greenhouse gas emissions, not incrementally, but radically. For wealthy countries like Canada, if we're gonna do our share, we need to be cutting our emissions by 10% a year. That's huge, that's unprecedented. So call it what you will, a Green New Deal, a great transition, a Marshall Plan for planet Earth, but make no mistake, this is a civilizational mission, not an add-on, one more item to add to a governmental to-do list, some special interest to satisfy. But let me stress something else. It is also not about saying that climate change is so big and so urgent that it should trump everything else. Like, first we'll save the planet and then we'll worry about poverty and inequality and racism. No. That's how we lose. That's how we divide ourselves. What we need to do is recognize that we live in a time of overlapping intersectional crises. Yes, the climate crisis, but also the crisis of institutionalized racism, the crisis of economic exclusion on a massive level, the crisis of militarism. And we need to design and then fight like hell for integrated solutions ones that radically bring down emissions at the same time as they create huge numbers of unionized jobs and deliver meaningful justice to indigenous people and other communities that have gotten the worst deal under the current extractive economy. And in North America, that overwhelmingly means communities of color. In other words, system change. The good news is that change is in the air. We see evidence of it everywhere from the incredible rise of social movements like Black Lives Matter, I Don't Know More, No One Is Illegal, fearlessly taking on state and corporate power. And we see it in the political sphere. We see it with Bernie Sanders' historic campaign to lead the Democratic Party. Bernie showed that what for decades was unsayable can now be said out loud. Free college tuition, double the minimum wage, 100% renewable energy, and the crowds cheered. He almost won. We saw it. We see it. Yeah, I think that's a person. We see it in Jeremy Corbyn's rise to the leadership of the British Labour Party and the determination of his supporters to keep him there despite relentless attacks and subversion. We see it in the rise of the demos in Spain and the election of Syriza in Greece, even in the global popularity of Pope Francis, who speaks about capitalism as a cancer. This is a huge shift. The intellectual fencing that has constrained the left's imagination for so long lies twisted on the ground. It began, in a sense, at the first World Social Forum 15 years ago. I covered that forum for the nation um, and I wrote at the time that this marked the end of the end of history. This lie that we had been told, that it was all over, that there was only one way to run the world now. Those were the first cracks in the facade, and then came the 2008 financial crisis, which threw a brick through the window. Suddenly, there was no one left to defend neoliberalism on its ideological merits. That doesn't mean it's dead. They smuggle it in post-crisis, from post-Brexit UK to post-coup Brazil to post-failed crew in Turkey, any crisis will do. But just because one ideological project has lost the argument does not mean that a better one automatically rises up to replace it. As much as we celebrate our victories, we also have to be honest with ourselves. 
have we put forward a genuine alternative worldview, one powerful enough to rival capitalism, to rival extractivism? There is no question. We've gotten very good at saying no. No to austerity, to imperialism, to corporate trade deals, to new wars. But 15 years after the end of the end of history, left governments are in crisis from Caracas to Athens, increasingly in conflict with the social movements that brought them to power. That know they are better than the alternative, but also that they're not good enough. And that's partly because the left imagination, while slowly freeing itself from neoliberalism, is not yet truly liberated. Too often, it remains shackled by developmentalism, by extractivism, unable to imagine an economic model that goes beyond nostalgia for a Keynesian or industrial socialist past. So too often, we remain stuck in old battles that we should have overcome by now, asking people to choose between jobs and the environment, poverty, or pollution. These false choices weaken and divide us, and we cannot afford that because our movements are not the only ones moving into the vacuum left by the collapse of neoliberal ideology. The shadow of the fascist right looms larger every day, from Trump to Le Pen, to open, the open racism of parts of the Brexit movement, and on and on. And if we want to win against the powerful seduction of that easy hatred, we will have to go deeper and further. That means more than just a list of demands, but a new story, a shared narrative, intersectional, integrated, and most of all, inspiring. I want to share with you uh, an attempt that Roger mentioned um, that I've been involved in here in Canada called the Leap Manifesto. About 11 months ago, a group of us here in Canada launched this 1,400 word document. It came out of a meeting uh, of 60 organizers, theorists, student leaders from across the country. Roger was there, Clay was there. Uh, many people in the room were there, part of drafting this. Um, it was hard, it was difficult, but we created a space to dream, uh, to not just agree on what we were against, but to think about the much better world that we could create. Um, we asked ourselves the question, if we took the science of climate change seriously, how could we transition off of fossil fuels in that way that solved multiple crises at once, crises at once. So we came up with this consensus document, and there was a thread running through it. And the thread was the need to move from an economy based on endless extraction, not just from the earth, but from workers' bodies, from our social safety net, of taking and taking as if there is no limit, as if there is no breaking point, to a culture of caretaking of respecting the cycles of regeneration, of caring for one another and caring for the earth, of cherishing beauty, creation, each other, young and old. This shift is fundamentally a rejection of the sacrifice zone mentality that some people and some places count for less. So it begins by acknowledging the original caretakers of the land, water, and air. One of the key demands is the full implementation of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, something our current government says it is doing at the same time as it approves projects like the Mega Dam of Site C, which is expressly opposed by Indigenous people who are impacted by it. One of the key demands of the, of the LEAF is for energy democracy, that as we move from fossil fuels to renewables, we don't just want to be buying our solar panels from Exxon and Chevron. We want their money to pay for it, in reparation for the damage that they've caused, but we want communities to own and control their own renewable energy projects. We were inspired by the incredible example of what project we've been involved in in Germany, but we also wanted to go further. We want energy justice, which means that as we transition, we want to heal the wounds that date back to the founding of our country, which is why the leap states that indigenous peoples and others on the front line of industrial activity should be first to receive public support for their own clean energy project, that this needs to be policy. Other points of unity that we found um, was connecting uh, the, the treatment of, uh, the horrible treatment of migrants that this people at this forum have caught a glimpse of in this incredible double standard uh, in the way visa applicants were treated. Um, we acknowledge the role that our government has played in pushing people off of their lands, 
whether through illegal wars, whether through corporate trade deals, or whether through climate change itself. And as such, it calls for full rights for all workers, regardless of immigration status, and opening our borders to many more migrants and refugees. We call for big investments in green infrastructure, as you would imagine, right? Renewables, efficiency, transit, high-speed rail, all of that. Um, we, are, we say these have to be union jobs paying a living wage, and we know that rather than fighting over the scraps of few jobs created over a pipeline, that these jobs in these sectors create six to eight times more jobs than the ones created by the oil and gas industry. So, but, so we do that, and, and you would expect that from, from, from a consensus document about climate change. But the other thing we want to do is completely redefine what a green job is. We think, say green job, you imagine a guy with a hard hat putting up a solar panel. Great, we want those. Um, but we also want to, wanted to, to recognize the work of caretaking. The low carbon sectors already out there, they're not recognized as being climate jobs. The work of caring for the old, for the young, for the sick, of teaching other low carbon sectors like the arts, public interest, media, these sectors that are under relentless attack by the logic of austerity. We say these are climate jobs. We say they need massive investments. Um, and we know the money is out there. We have to go after it. Uh, that means an end to fossil fuel subsidies, another so far broken promise from the Trudeau government. Sorry for the non-Canadians, but I have to do this. Financial transaction taxes, <laughs> increased royalties on fossil fuel extraction, higher income taxes on corporations and wealthy people, a progressive carbon tax, cuts to military spending, the polluter pays. Simple rule, front lines first, polluter pays, climate justice. Um, <laughs> We want a national, we, we don't want any more of these trade deals. We want to renegotiate the ones that we have already signed that are standing in the way of meaningful climate action. And we want a national debate uh, on a guaranteed annual income and whether that is a real solution um, to keep people from feeling like they have to take these jobs and there's no alternative. The workers that are in those high carbon sectors need to be democratically leading this transition and they need the resources to be retrained to work in the low carbon economy. So it's a lot. Um, it's been endorsed by 200 organizations, very diverse from Black Lives Matter Toronto to Oxfam, um, to Leonard Cohen, to Montrealer, Montrealer, um, Arcade Fire, another Montreal band, little Montreal props. Um, the, the corporate press has been understated. Um, national suicide, I believe, was the uh, one of our national newspapers called it madness. It was described as madness. This plan for a Canada based on caring for one another and the earth uh, by our national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. Um, but the really exciting thing, since we put out this blueprint, this framework, this um, beginning of a plan, is the way it's been picked up and built on. Um, particularly in the trade union movement. I was on a panel this morning with Mike Palachuk, who is the head of the Postal Workers Union here in Canada. And Mike talked about incredible union, just the, you know, the model of a visionary union. They are fighting for their lives, that postal, uh, the, the post office is under threat of privatization, of massive cutbacks. Um, our previous government wanted to cancel uh, home mail delivery. And working with our team, the postal workers came up with a plan called Delivering Community Power that puts the post office at the center of the green trans transition. So the post office isn't just a place where you get the mail, it's also where you recharge your electric vehicles. The whole fleet would be transitioned to Made in Canada electric vehicles. Um, postal banking, support for local green cooperatives, loans, solar panels on the roof, um, and doing more than delivering the mail, delivering local, local food and, and not doing door knocking for the elderly and being the center of the caring economy. This is how we need to think. And I'm so impressed with the postal workers because it shows that we can do more than just protect an unacceptable status quo. We can dream. We can dream of something better than we've ever seen before. Also understated, the premier of British Columbia, right-wing premier, um, said that if the LEAP is implemented, hundreds of towns will literally be wiped off of the map. Um, the premier of Saskatchewan said it's an existential threat. 
we thought that was climate change, but whatever. The exciting thing is people are spooked. They know this is where the future is. We understand right now that we have gone so far off course and we have wasted so much time that now we're just on a precipice. There, we have so far that we need to go um, and we have so little time to get there. And when you're in a situation like that, if you take a small step off that precipice, you fall in, right? And that's why small steps in this moment in history are not enough. Now is the time for boldness. Now is the time to leap. Thank you. quelque chose. Il y a une énorme foule qui est à l'extérieur de cette salle et qui aurait voulu se joindre à nous. Nous savions que cet événement-là allait être un des plus populaires au Forum Social Mondial et nous nous étions organisés pour que cet événement soit retransmis dans une autre des grandes salles. Je ne sais pas pourquoi ça n'a pas été fait ce soir, mais je vous prie, je vous prie, en sortant d'ici, si vous avez des amis là-bas, expliquez-leur que ce n'est pas nous qui avons fait un peu ce dégât-là pour eux ce soir. Malheureusement, on savait qu'il y aurait beaucoup de gens et nous avons essayé de prendre une autre salle. On nous l'avait promis, mais malheureusement, ce n'est pas le cas. N'empêche, nous allons continuer à la soirée. So we continue leaving. We're very happy to have a tremendous amount of interesting people on the panel. And the next person I would like to introduce is Anne-Céline Guillon. Anne-Céline Guillon est la porte-parole de Stop Olé au Duc. C'est le mouvement qui regroupe tous les comités de citoyens opposés au pipeline Energy Est à travers le Québec. C'est un mouvement immense. On a connu le mouvement étudiant, on a connu le mouvement anti-austérité, et maintenant je suis convaincu qu'on connaîtra le mouvement contre le pipeline Energy Est. Anne-Céline Guillon. Bonsoir tout le monde. Donc je vais vous faire une rapide présentation effectivement de, de, de la mobilisation contre le pipeline Energy Est au Québec. Euh, un rapide, une rapide présentation de qu'est-ce que c'est que cette bête-là. C'est tout simplement un, un oléoduc qui euh, éventuellement traverserait le Canada euh, pour se rendre de l'Alberta euh, jusqu'au Nouveau-Brunswick euh, dans l'optique véritablement de euh, permettre à l'industrie des bitumineux de continuer son expansion et de pouvoir euh, exporter ce pétrole sale des sables bitumineux à l'extérieur du Canada pour le vendre euh, au prix, à des prix du marché euh, plus intéressants. Ce, ce pétrole est principalement destiné à la Chine, à l'Inde, à l'Europe également. Donc, c'est un pipeline qui ferait quand même passer près d'un 1,1 million de barils par jour, ce qui est énorme, ça en ferait euh, tout simplement le tuyau le plus gros en Amérique du Nord. Euh, et surtout, c'est un tuyau qui symbolise à lui seul véritablement euh, le fait que le Canada veut continuer à se mettre la tête dans les sables de l'itume. <rire> Comment le mouvement Stop Olé au Duc est né euh, Il est né grâce, euh, en fait, pour vous faire une petite histoire courte, euh, on a commencé à entendre parler du pipeline Energie S à peu près une semaine après l'accident du lac Mégantic. L'accident du lac Mégantic, c'est le fameux accident de train de pétrole qui a explosé dans un village, lac Mégantic, dans le sud du Québec, qui a causé la mort de 49 personnes. Et comme par hasard, une semaine après, on entendait parler de, donc, de ce fameux pipeline Energy Est. Et euh, le, le discours de la compagnie qui est tout, tout trouvé, c'est-à-dire, ben, vous voyez, les trains, c'est dangereux, on vous propose une autre solution, les oléoducs, c'est beaucoup plus sécuritaire. 
Après cette annonce-là, plusieurs comités citoyens ont vu le jour euh, à travers la province, notamment grâce, euh, on doit le dire, à la, à la vigilance de certaines ONG, qui ont, euh, notamment Equiter et Evacuel PA, qui ont mené des conférences un peu partout dans le Québec, le long de l'éventuel tracé, pour alerter les citoyens de ce qui s'en venait. Et il euh, y a un véritable sentiment d'indignation qui, euh, qui a gagné les, les citoyens québécois, et c'est comme ça que les mouvements, euh, en tout cas les comités stopologiques, sont nés. Mais les stopologiques ne sont pas seuls, ils font partie d'un grand regroupement de comités citoyens, il y en a plus de 150 maintenant au Québec, euh, qui s'appelle le regroupement Vigilance Hydrocarbures Québec, et même en dehors du regroupement Vigilance Hydrocarbures Québec, il y a d'autres aussi comités citoyens. Bref, on a une mobilisation citoyenne à l'heure actuelle au, au Québec qui est quand même faramineuse, qui est énorme, euh, et, et surtout qui, euh, non seulement lutte contre Energef, mais lutte de façon générale contre euh, l'exploration, l'exploitation et le transport des énergies fossiles au Québec. Pourquoi on s'oppose à Énergie Est Tout simplement parce que Énergie Est, tout simplement parce que Énergie Est, à lui tout seul, symbolise euh, le, de continuer à euh, vendre un modèle euh, du passé, un modèle tourné vers les énergies fossiles, un modèle extractiviste. Euh, qui fait fi du droit des peuples à, dire, euh, à, à, à protéger leur territoire, à dire non à ce genre de projet. Euh, évidemment aussi parce qu'il symbolise euh, à lui tout seul de continuer à, à, à nier la cause des changements climatiques. Et donc si les comités citoyens au Québec s'opposent à l'énergie S, c'est vraiment fondamentalement parce que euh, nous sommes contre le, le fait de continuer dans ce modèle-là. Nous voulons véritablement une transition énergétique, une transition juste, et nous voulons euh, surtout euh, la protection de nos terres, la protection des terres agricoles et la protection de notre potable également. Suite, après, une fois, une fois les comités citoyens créés, ceux-ci se sont tout de suite très vite en fait rendu compte qu'ils avaient besoin de créer des outils pour pouvoir continuer la mobilisation. Et c'est là qu'est née l'idée de créer leur propre campagne de communication et de euh, permettre d'avoir des outils pour euh, étayer leurs arguments et pouvoir euh, continuer à faire le travail de mobilisation sur le terrain. Et c'est là qu'est née la campagne « Coule pas chez nous », qui est la campagne maintenant citoyenne par excellence euh, de la lutte énergétique, mais de façon plus générale de la lutte au transport de pétrole extrême au Québec, puisque on lutte aussi contre le transport par train et par navire citerne. L'idée de, de, de mettre l'accent sur le transport, c'est vraiment de, de bloquer finalement euh, l'expansion le, éventuelle euh, de la production en amont. Euh, alors, où on parle aujourd'hui, le mouvement euh, d'opposition à Énergie Est est en croissance. Euh, ça fait maintenant trois ans à peu près qu'on lutte contre Énergie S et la mobilisation ne cesse de grandir. Pourquoi elle ne cesse de grandir ben C'est notamment grâce à la fameuse campagne Coupa chez nous qui nous a permis d'acquérir une certaine crédibilité et de pouvoir euh, vraiment informer beaucoup euh, la population québécoise, que ce soit euh, grâce à des outils informatiques, à des, euh, à des flyers, à du porte-à-porte. -porte. C'est grâce au travail acharné de milliers de citoyens qui justement, le soir, après le travail, malgré la fatigue, malgré le fait qu'ils doivent s'occuper des enfants, vont cogner aux portes et vont informer leurs concitoyens de ce qui s'en vient ici au Québec. Mais c'est aussi grâce euh, à l'alliance qui se fait de plus en plus forte entre les comités citoyens et les ONG. Et c'est grâce à, cette, euh, à ces alliances de plus en plus fortes qu'aujourd'hui, euh, on peut dire qu'il y a à peu près 60% quand même de la population québécoise qui s'oppose à l'oléoduc Énergie S. Mais cette opposition, cette alliance est loin d'être terminée. Euh, J'ai envie de dire que ce n'est même qu'un commencement. Euh, je parlais de l'alliance avec les ONG, mais c'est un travail qui toujours est à, euh, je dirais, à entretenir, à continuer. Mais c'est aussi l'alliance avec euh, les Premières Nations euh, qui est en cours, qui, qui se travaille, qui à mon avis n'est pas encore assez forte, mais euh, qui se développe au fur et à mesure du, de la croissance du mouvement citoyen. C'est aussi euh, l'alliance avec les groupes de l'Ouest, euh, pareil, ce qui n'est pas forcément toujours évident pour des questions historiques au Canada, mais il y a un travail de plus en plus important avec... Euh, les groupes de l'Ouest qui luttent aussi contre le pipeline énergétique et même contre les autres oléoducs, puisqu'il y a d'autres projets d'oléoducs au Canada, au Canada, 
notre bonne gateway, Kaido euh, Morgan, par exemple, en Colombie-Britannique. Encore une fois, ces alliances-là, elles sont en construction. Euh, il faut continuer dans ce sens-là. On a encore beaucoup de travail à faire, mais c'est ce qui fait que, encore une fois, la, la mobilisation véritablement prend de l'ampleur. Et aujourd'hui, au Québec, on peut dire que plus les gens sont informés et plus les gens s'opposent à Énergie Est. Aujourd'hui, il y a près de 300 municipalités au Québec qui s'opposent à Énergie Est, dont la communauté métropolitaine de Montréal, qui réunit quand même à elle seule près de la moitié de la population du Québec. C'est un geste fort qu'ils ont posé. Les syndicats sont de plus en plus présents avec nous, la CSN et la FTQ, qui regroupent à eux seuls les plus gros euh, syndicat du Québec, FTQ, on l'apprenait ce matin, que c'était devenu officiel, qu'effectivement, ils, ils osaient dire qu'ils étaient contre Énergie S, pour les mêmes raisons que nous, c'est-à-dire pour la protection du climat, mais également parce que... N'importe quel bord qu'on le prenne, que ce soit du côté économique, du côté environnemental, du côté de la protection des droits humains, n'a aucun bon sens. Euh, il y a également l'Association des Premières Nations du Québec, la Barre d'Or, qui regroupe à peu près 40 communautés au Québec, qui aussi ont passé une résolution forte d'opposition à l'énergie S. Et un soutien qu'on n'attendait vraiment pas, et je dois dire que quand je l'ai lu dans le journal en début de semaine, j'ai fait « wow <rire> !» C'est celle de la Défense Nationale Canadienne qui ne s'oppose pas forcément véritablement, et qui dit quand même qu'elle a de très fortes réserve quant au projet, justement pour les questions de euh, lutte au changement climatique, mais aussi parce que euh, au niveau de, de déversement éventuel, tout ça, la compagnie euh, n'accède même pas à leur réponse à l'eau. C'est-à-dire que la compagnie Trans-Canada, depuis le début de l'annonce du projet, a une attitude extrêmement arrogante avec tout le monde et même avec l'armée canadienne. Ça vous montre un peu dans quelle dynamique nous sommes et à qui on a affaire, si même avec l'armée. Euh, ils, euh, ils, ils osent en tout cas avoir cette attitude-là. Donc maintenant, je vous ai fait vraiment un portrait général de la mobilisation, puis où on en est un peu. Est qui, à mon avis, quels sont les défis du mouvement euh, d'opposition à Énergie S de façon générale ben, C'est de continuer les alliances, évidemment, approfondir ces alliances avec les Premières Nations, avec les ONG, avec euh, les différents acteurs de la société civile québécoise pour vraiment envoyer le message que tout le Québec s'oppose à l'oléoduc Énergie S. Mais c'est aussi, euh, j'ai envie de dire, continuer en tout cas, euh, essayer, travailler fort à justement faire converger les luttes, euh, puisque comme je disais tout à l'heure, Énergie S, c'est oui, c'est le symbole de la lutte au changement climatique, mais c'est aussi le symbole de, 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 des... Euh, des impacts que ce genre de projet peuvent avoir sur euh, les droits humains, notamment les droits des populations autochtones ici au Canada. Euh, et donc, pour ces raisons-là, je pense que euh, s'il y a un projet qui peut justement nous permettre euh, d'asseoir dans l'action de plus en plus la convergence des luttes, c'est bien celui-là. Et le défi, je pense, dans les mois et les années qui viennent, ça va être justement de pouvoir se réunir et, et, et à travers la lutte au pipeline de façon générale, pas juste à énergie S et aux énergies fossiles, j'ai envie de dire de façon générale, euh, envoyer le message que la société civile est de toute façon prête à passer à, un autre, euh, à, à une autre étape et veut une véritable transition énergétique. L'autre défi, je pense, c'est aussi, euh, ça va être de travailler aussi avec l'Europe, notamment avec éventuellement les, euh, les clients du pétrole sale albertain pour justement que ces, ces, ces populations-là se mobilisent et, et boycottent ce pétrole-là pour justement éviter que nous, on ait appris localement à lutter contre ces projets-là. Parce que n'oublions pas que si on a à lutter contre ça, c'est parce qu'il y a des clients. Donc plus on favorisera euh, le fait de mobiliser le monde à l'extérieur du Canada et plus, évi plus évidemment on aura... Euh, de facilité à lutter contre euh, les habitudes albertains. Et j'ai envie de dire, je pense que l'autre grand défi de euh, la lutte euh, aux énergies fossiles de façon générale, et particulièrement du projet Énergie S, c'est que lutter contre un projet, c'est une chose. Mais il ne vaut pas nous contenter de lutter contre, il faut proposer. Et c'est là que je pense que le, le Lit Manifesto est un merveilleux outil pour ça, parce que il nous, il, il nous 
je pense qu'il nous sert de base pour justement, il peut nous servir de base pour commencer à travailler sur le nouveau modèle de société qu'on veut pour le Canada. Donc je remercie vraiment Naomi Klein et son, et, et son équipe pour avoir mis, en tout cas, écrit ce manifeste. Euh, manifeste qui d'ailleurs s'inspire un peu d'un premier manifeste qui, a été écrit au, qui avait été écrit au Québec, qui s'appelle Les Langues Globales, qui avait été écrit un an avant, qui allait un peu moins loin que le livre qui était déjà un mouvement de conscience québécois qui avait été signé par près de 45 000 personnes et qui justement disait non et tout est possible. Et je pense que ce slogan aussi, à lui tout seul, résume bien la situation. Il faut effectivement s'opposer, mais à partir du moment où on aura bloqué tous ces projets, on pourra véritablement proposer quelque chose, et on pourra bâtir le monde de demain pour les générations futures, euh, un monde euh, empreint de justice climatique et de justice sociale. Merci. Merci Anne-Céline. Anne-Céline a fait allusion à quelque chose de très important. Cette grande union, cette unité qui se développe au Québec, incluant les mouvements populaires, les mouvements communautaires, le mouvement environnemental bien sûr, et le mouvement syndical. Et donc il y a des groupes au niveau international qui se sont donnés comme tâche, comme devoir, de travailler au sein du mouvement syndical pour faire cette jonction entre ceux qui se battent pour l'environnement la justice climatique et la lutte contre les inégalités sociales et donc le mouvement syndical. Un de ces groupes qui a permis de développer le concept de transition juste, non seulement un concept défensif, mais un concept de transformation sociale, c'est le groupe Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, c'est-à-dire les syndicats pour l'énergie démocratique ou la démocratisation de l'énergie. Et je suis très heureux ce soir de vous présenter Maïté Lanos, de Trade Unions for Energy Marketing. Merci Roger. Je m'appelle Maïté. Mon nom est Maïté, je viens de l'Argentine et j'ai été l'un des gagnants de la Visa Lottery. Je veux juste dire que c'est un peu... it on Monday, but it's, it's okay, I'm here, and, but I really, it really, it's really sad to be in a World Social Forum with such a few people from the South, and knowing the reason why people from the South are not here. So, um, yes, I think that we need to keep saying this, because otherwise it's going to be yes, nothing happens. I'm part of this network, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, and it is a new initiative, but it's not new for trade unions, the question of environment, even if it sounds like it is. Uh, trade unions have been working on environment for years. Uh, they have, when we talk about occupational safety and health at the workplace, in many cases we are talking about environment, we are talking about dealing with chemicals, we are talking about the cycle of production and disposal and recycling and things like that. So trade unions have been dealing with these issues for years. And also there have been trade union struggles related to what some people call the ecology of the poor. Being Chico Mendes, a Brazilian trade union, is one of the main leaders of the struggle of the Seringueiros, the rubber tupper workers in, in the Amazons. So trade unions for energy democracy is a new initiative but it's based on a trade union uh, tradition to fight at the workplace. And when we're thinking of the workplace, it's not only the factory, the worker with a helmet. Today the workplace is also a city. If we think that 40% of the workers in the world are, are working in informal economy, many of them are related to environment working on uh, recycling. They are related to environment, as uh, Naomi was saying, uh, working on health issues. Nurses United have, have, been one, have been dealing with the consequences of climate change in the in hospitals, 
teachers are dealing with climate change issues. So it's not only about the picture we can make of ourselves, of, of what a worker is like. And then based on those traditions and the differences, uh, different trade unions, we have been building this initiative of unions that were not happy only defending their jobs, defending the, their jobs and being on the side of business, defending the dirty industries, etc. Of course there are workers that are defending their jobs because they are being faced to, with this, or you defend, or, or, or it's your job or environment, and of course some of them are defending their jobs, and it's human too. But the others, are not defending only their jobs because they believe that climate change, as, as the uh, unions were saying in Paris and before, there are no jobs in a dead planet. So what can, what can we, uh, it's, it's not a question of uh, your job, but all jobs in the world are at stake with the, with the situation we have uh, today. But, um, those trade unions that are in, in, in the Trade Unions for Energy Democracy initiative, they are not happy either with greening the economy at any cost, with greening the economy led by the market and leaving social justice outside. Uh, those unions working on, uh, on this initiative, we want to change the system with social justice and with ecological justice. And therefore, we have been working on this idea of uh, just transition. Many unions were working on that, not only those involving in uh, Chile, but all of them. And uh, that concept came out of our of union participation in the climate change talks, the climate change negotiations. And why did unions got involved in climate change negotiations? Because we thought, well, you know, if we are talking about climate change, it seems that we are going to, if, and if we want to face it, and if we want to change the situation, then it, see, it means that production and consumption models are going to change. Then we want to be part of it, and we as humans want to, want to have a say there, because if the production system is going to change, then of course many jobs are going to be lost, and others may be created, but guess what? The, the climate change negotiations are not about system change. They are about uh, business as usual. They are about opening the space for corporate uh, interests to green the economy by the same means, by market-oriented uh, mechanisms. So, um, and, the, and, the, uh, and even if all the politicians were there uh, shaking hands and we're very happy to to have an agreement in Paris and even with the just transition concept in the in the preamble um, it is no more than a license to pollute and the, the predecessor of the Paris agreement is the bilateral agreement between China and the US which set up the roof for each country's emission so that, that, and, and it means that countries gave themselves the, the license to pollute until 2030. So in that, in that context, still there are national commitments and still we need to hold governments accountable for what they said they were going to do in Paris or what they say they are going to do at the national level. And let's imagine a world where some countries want to apply in the practice the just transition. What is just transition? It is a transition to a low carbon economy with decent jobs, with living wages and with decent working conditions. But what do we face at the same time? And it happened, and, and uh, when governments want to apply just transition, not led by the market, but publicly led just transition or any kind of transition, they are facing the free trade agreements or the free trade architecture all over the world. And let just let me talk about three examples. First, the major one, the WTO. 
the, the World Trade Organization, that in the name of market access, in the name of national treatment, the most favored nation, um, they, they want to create, a trans the, the, the WTO is to create a transparent trade system without market unfair distortions. And lately, one of the unfair distortions was the uh, initiative of India to have uh, to produce solar panels with local jobs. And you know what? The U.S. said, oh, no, no, that is not possible. That is an unfair uh, uh, trade practice. So India has to stop with their policy. Um, second example is what Naomi was talking before, the new free trade agreements that include the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. And I, I, I can imagine that in Canada you are aware of it because the NAFTA happily has it. And, and Canada has been sued more than any other country uh, under this mechanism, being the Ontario Green Economy Act and the uh, Mesa Power against Ontario, one of the, of the most relevant cases uh, because the, the clause, the bilocal clause has been challenged by by the uh, by, a com by a foreign company, and I would like to invite all of you to watch to 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 take a look at the USTR website where they explain why ISDS is actually a very democratic uh, uh, instrument, and they say that this is very good because actually uh, local um, justice tend to be impartial. But of course, the courts in New York, they are not impartial. They, are, they, are, they will not rule for corporations. They will, of course, rule for the public good. Um, and lastly, there is the, the TISA. It's the agreement on services. And a few days before the Paris, the, talk, the, the Paris negotiations started last year, uh, the energy chapter of, of TISA was leaked, so we, you could read it on the weekly. And I think that TISA is particularly uh, a problem for, for any kind of transition. First, for all, for the scope. It, it, it not only stops at the national level, but any kind of policy taken by a regional government, a municipality government, and even it might be by an indigenous community with decision capacity. So any kind of decision has to be uh, adapted to what, what to TISA regulations. And uh, the very um, tricky thing of it is like in, in the case of the energy chapter, and uh, let, let me say that TISA is just the result of the failed negotiations at the WTO the gaps failed negotiation because they were facing many uh, resistances from the mostly from developing countries. And then TISA is the result of what they call the best friends of, of services. So 23 countries are, uh, around the world that are the best friends of services are promoting secretly this agreement, being one of the chapters, the chapter on energy. And uh, the chapter on energy is uh, what is regulated there is related to services, related to exploitation, exploration, development and distribution of energy. And it talks about neutrality in technology. It means that any kind of technology, solar, fracking, or any, any uh, technology related to energy is going to be under this chapter. And um, uh, there is this paragraph that is wonderful, I would like to read it, because it's the Article 5 of the Annex on, uh, on Energy. Parties recognize state sovereignty and sovereignty rights over energy resources, but they reaffirm that such rights must be, must be exercised in accordance with and subject to the rules of international law. It means to trade. So, <laughs> since when sovereignty? has to be, uh, you know, <laughs> ruled by trade. So, but this is what is being negotiated behind the, behind the scenes. Um, and, and it is, 
I don't want to just give like a very negative, <laughs> you know, uh, vision. Because first of all, because in this continent we stopped uh, FTAA with very active action of the Canadian. <laughs> that we can still win these battles and uh, I think that we need to do it all at the same time. We don't have like two parallel moments where we can fight for environment one day and then for free trade and then for the alternatives. We have to do everything together because as Naomi was saying, it's time to, or I don't know if you were saying it now or in the movie, but at the events, like it's time to run, run like a buffalo. And I really like that because I think that this is what we have to do now. At the same time, fighting for environment stopping free trade agreements and creating alternatives. And of course, all this, we have to do it together. It's not trade unions alone that are going to deal with governments to have better working conditions. We need to continue building alliances as we have been building for more, more than 20 years. As I, I was also in the first World Social Forum and I remember you, and I, I don't like to say this because it's, I'm getting old, you know. I am not to Roy saying that we needed to fight transnational corporations because they were at the core of the, of the system. And we still have to do it. And we still need to build alternatives. And we are doing it in different places in the world. And that's why we're here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here in the World Social Forum. So thank you very much. Je vous raconte une petite histoire. Dans les mois qui préparaient l'accord 21 à Paris, j'avais été invité à une réunion peu importe qui se tenait à Paris au mois d'octobre. Et cette réunion était présidée par une véritable boule d'énergie vivante. Et je me dis, c'est pas possible. Comment quelqu'un peut être capable de parler trois langues, s'agiter de quatre manières différentes, puis arriver quand même à unir cette foule-là Et cette personne-là, c'est Tazumar. Ceux qui le connaissent savent de quoi je parle. Is it real? I don't know what to call your ball of fire. Please, that's your mother. De la Fondation Rosa Luxembourg Berlin. Et aussi un militant de la justice climatique absolument incroyable. Tadio. A very kind introduction. I think he's just misreading my ADHD as, as some sort of youth for my Just just hyperactivity, and I'm already sorry for the translators. Um, they, they will hate me at, at the end of this evening. And, and you'll be bored because I'll be saying very similar things as my did, just with a lot less knowledge and background. So um, I'm just invited to shout. Um, okay, so, right. Uh, mes amis, uh, mes camarades, c'est le pouvoir qui compte. Friends, it's all about power. Stopping runaway climate change and preventing massive climate injustice is only in a very immediate and simple and almost banal way about stopping the emissions of CO2 and methane. The fight for climate justice isn't about particles and parts per million and bloody polar bears. <laughs> Sorry, it's a long-running joke between Naomi and I. I'm not, I, I sometimes get called an environmentalist and I can't stand nature then. I'm just, a, I'm just a gay urban intellectual, but like basically it's about capitalism and it's about power. It's not about polar bears and about parts per million. It's about capitalism and it's about power. And that's why the climate justice movement, and the movement of movements such as it still is in this first, first world social forum, that's why our movements have to do everything, and I really mean everything we can, to stop CETA and TPP and TTIP. They're, they're, they're sometimes called free trade agreements, but they're not. They're obscene capitalists' bills of rights. And if they are passed, so many of our struggles, our local, regional, national struggles, will be for naught. It's exactly as Maite has described. And this is not, this is not speculation. We can look in the, the, the power in the energy sector. 
there actually already is a TPP and a CETA and a TTIP for the energy sector. It's called the Energy Charter Treaty. And um, I wanted to tell you a story about what's been going on in Germany, where you may have heard that there is this beautiful project called the Energiewende, the, the, the energy transition. And um, a quick parenthesis, because this has been the uh, Abash Your Government panel tonight. Um, <laughs> At least for some of us. Uh, basically, we don't. And I, 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 I would very much uh, like to see your your, your prime minister uh, half oiled up and naked at the. Uh, no, no, oiled up and half naked. I was going to say oiled up and half naked at the um, at, at the gay pride march on Sunday, um, which would be delightful, really, because then you couldn't fuck up the migration policy so much. Um, so our our leader is not somebody I. I that's. Uh, I don't imagine her at the Gay Pride March. Um, but she's as good a liar as, as, as your Prime Minister. She runs around the world pretending that the German government has got this great energy transition project, when this was not a government project. This was a social movement project from the very beginning. What? Because, so, what people generally don't know is uh, Germany is not actually the world champion in renewable energy, it's the a world champion in lignite production. The dirtiest of all the fossil fuels in the world, in absolute terms, which country digs up and burns more of that stuff than any other country in the world? You might think China, you might think India, but no. No, it's your friendly world champion in energy transition, Germany. So that's what the government does, right? So what do social movements do? We fought for 35 years in the anti-nuclear movement and finally forced an unwilling government when Fukushima exploded we forced an unwilling government into a nuclear phase-out. That was us, the social movements. <laughs> what happened in the world of capitalist bills of rights and the energy charter treaty? Vattenfall, a Swedish state-owned energy company, which is active in Germany, went and sued the German government for several billion euros because they said, oh no, we, we have these lovely nuclear plants. We wanted to keep on you know, destroying the world and making profit with that. Now you, you screwed that up. So please give us the money that we think we would have made in the next 10, 15 years. Now, Germany is a very rich country. Even if it loses that case, it'll go ahead with that nuclear phase out. But what will poorer countries do? What will Germany do the next time this kind of thing happens? This, there's one victory, which is really significant, because social movements don't generally score such enormous victories in the power sector, could be eaten up by the Energy Charter Treaty, just like all our other victories in the future could be eaten up by CETA and TPP. Another thing that's been really great about the German energy transition is that we've got this expansion of renewable energies that aren't owned by large-scale corporations. Over 60% of all installed renewable capacity in Germany is owned by individuals, by farmers, by, 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 by co-ops, by local municipal, um, by, by municipal utilities. And that's all the result of a very intelligent law that was passed, the German feed-in tariffs law, which privileges renewable energies when they get fed into the grid. But what about technology neutrality? Those sorts of laws could very easily be subject to a challenge under the rules that are being negotiated in TISA and, T and, and, and TPP and CETA. So, the two cornerstones so far of the German energy transition, the nuclear phase-out and the German feed-in tariffs law, are both under acute attack under the Energy Charter Treaty and will be even more in danger if those crazy bills of rights get passed. So, now there's another element in our fight for a democratic renewable energy transition in Germany, and that is our fight for a coal phase-out. We've decided that it's pretty ridiculous that Germany runs around the world saying we're world energy transition champion, but has this crazy lignite policy where, and I'll say this again because you might have forgotten it in the last two minutes, we dig up and burn more of the dirtiest of all the fossil fuels in the world than any other country in the world. That sort of stuff. So, We've decided, as movements in Germany, to launch a massive fight against coal. Last year, 1,200 of us went in, a massive, in the action of mass civil disobedience called Ende Gelände, which means kind of Yabasta in German, like, until here and no further. 
and for one day we blockaded the lignite infrastructure in the west of Germany. This year, last year we were 1,200, we did it for a day. This year we did the same thing again, we were 4,000, we did it for a whole weekend, and they couldn't stop us. I don't know if you guys, you sort of, you, you're, you know, aficionados or aficionadas of mass civil disobedience. I, I think it's pretty awesome. Like those kind of actions, if they work out, it gives you a kick. It's unbelievable. It's incomparable to anything. Well, probably that I'll experience at Gay Pride on Sunday. But um, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty awesome anyway. So, um, but the point is, I really do. I really do. I live. I burn for these actions. That's where I get the crazy energy from that, that you mentioned. But the problem is that. We can shut down every pipeline on its own, every coal-fired power plant, every mine. We can organize so much and so well, and we can win every one of those fights. But if they pass those Bill of Rights for capitalists, those fights will be for naught. All the stuff that we do, all the stuff that feels good, all these moments of empowerment that we can organize when we do mass civil disobedience, they will just transfer the power to another level where we can't go. Our power is on the streets. Our power is in those mass blockades. And if they transfer the power to the global level of CETA and TTIP and TISA, the, the, the level where executives and lawyers live and, 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 and global politicians, then we will not be able to go there. Then our power, our struggles will be lost. So we have to do everything, and as I said it before, I really mean everything, to stop them from signing these bills of rights. And Mate said it, we've already done it. In, the United, in, in, in North America, FDA was prevented. But before that, in 1998, even before the first World Social Forum, they'd already tried this 20 years ago. They tried to sign a capitalist bill of rights, which was called the Multilateral Agreement on Investment. And some of the folks here in this room may remember that. It was actually a Canadian NGO which leaked the text of that agreement. And Mobilizations ensued around the world and a nascent ultra-mondialist movement defeated this capitalist Bill of Rights then in 1998. And we can do it again. We can do it again. We can fight and win against these capitalist Bills of Rights. Because that other world that we always say is possible, it's not just possible, it's already here. It's here in this room, it's at this forum, it's especially with the people who cannot be at this forum because of the fucked up migration policies of the guy who should be in a panda on Sunday, on the street, and not doing these crazy policies. We can win this, we have to win this. Thank you very much. Six years ago, I was invited to a meeting in Northern Ontario by what was the Canadian Auto Workers Union at the time. And I met this incredible activist from First Nations who spoke about the need to craft, to develop, to build an alliance of labor movement, First Nations, and Quebecois militants. And I'd like to introduce to you tonight one of the founders of Idle No More and the fondateur of Idle No More, mon camarade de combat, mon frère, Clayton Thomas Mark. women from Saskatchewan. I was just uh, one of their helpers that was told to do stuff and I made sure and listened. I, uh, hey everybody. Wow, I, I'm sorry, I'm still blown away by all of these incredible speakers and, and the thought of Justin Trudeau all oiled up. <laughs> yeah. That's quite the image. <laughs> uh, as Roger mentioned, my name is Clayton Thomas Mueller. I'm a Cree man from Huggetawagan Cree Nation, Treaty 6 territory in northern Manitoba. And uh, I wanted to first and foremost recognize the traditional territory that we're all gathered in here today. This is the traditional territory of uh, the the community of Gunasatage, and uh, I don't know if Ellen Gabriel's out in the audience, but if she is, big, big shout out to you. I, uh, 
I was camping with my sons and my beautiful wife, uh, Corinne, last week at the National Cree Gathering, the 18th National Cree Gathering in Fisher River First Nation, Southern Manitoba. And at that gathering, they had a sacred bundle of sacred artifacts of Indigenous peoples from the region. And part of that was the pipe of one of our greatest chiefs, uh, Chief Big Bear. And on the pipe, on the stem of the pipe of Chief Big Bear, there's snare wire on the stem. And what the snare wire represents, you know, uh, here in Canada, Indigenous people, still to this day, we hunt, we fish, we trap, we live off the land. We are the land. The land is us. We come from the land and eventually we return back to it. And what that snare wire represented on that pipe of Big Bear, who was a revolutionary, he fought alongside, I believe, uh, Louis Rial, and he ended up uh, in Stony Mountain Penitentiary, where so many of our relatives are right now. And that snare wire, going back to that, what that represents, the old people at that gathering, they said that that represents um, how we got to get our young people back. We have to snare them like rabbits, get them back to the culture. Because it's our culture that, you know, for us as indigenous peoples, that's what we have to think about when we think about global issues like climate change. And that's really what all of humanity needs to think about, you know, to quote one of my lifelong teachers and dear friend, Tom Goldtooth, the director of the Indigenous Environmental Network, he says, when we talk about climate change, what we're really talking about is members of the five-fingered nation, that's you and me, all of humanity, you know, this race thing is, is bullshit. When we talk about climate change, when we talk about climate change, we're really talking about reevaluating our relationship as humanity to the sacredness of Mother Earth, a relationship that has been damaged you know, we all have a spiritual umbilical cord to that sacredness of Mother Earth that has been catastrophically damaged, not severed though, but damaged by this psychotic Western industrial scientific experiment called capitalism. And one of the reasons I think why in this hyper individualistic society we have this sickness, the sickness that's rampant throughout all of our communities, throughout our nation states, even this settler colonial state that they call Canada, you know, and that sickness is greed. Greed, consumption, to fill an empty space inside, a space that used to be filled by a connection to nature. You know, a couple of years ago, Statistics Canada put out a staggering statistic. They said that over 50% of indigenous peoples in this country now live in our urban centers, places like Montreal, places like Toronto, Winnipeg, the city where I live. You know, and this really troubled me because all of our people, you know, are, 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 are continuing to be marginalized, the most marginalized segment of our society, economically, politically, spiritually, socially. And, you know, everybody hates former Prime Minister Harper, well, almost everybody, you know, there's some <laughs> greedy capitalists out there that dig them. But, you know, Prime Minister Harper and his conservative government, they were the ones, you know, I want to remind you, who enforced the austerity agenda that was implemented by the Liberal government before them. And in First Nations, that meant enforcing a 2% cap on essential funding services for the most marginalized segment of Canadian society that created a circumstance in our communities where we have a suicide of our children killing them, uh, an epidemic a suicide of our children killing themselves, our young people. You know, and this is happening all across the country. And it's happening because of the fact that they've made it so bad to live on the reserve, okay? The socioeconomic crisis in our reservations is so bad that our young people have lost hope and they're taking their own lives. And I just wanted to say that, you know, Roger brought up I don't know more. You know, for me, I don't know more was something that I looked at from the fringes, you know, at a time when the Harper government was passing these draconian pieces of legislation, gutting 40 years of environmental policy, gutting 40 years of social and health policy, 
gutting all of the participatory democratic mechanisms in our society aimed at giving citizens an opportunity to have a voice in how policies are designed, gutted and entrenching all of that power in the office of the prime minister, okay? You know, our women rose up like they always do and they started to go to work and they started to organize. Myself and so many other allied campaigners were like, that's something I can believe in. You know, that's something I can definitely work on and, and help out, you know, to help that out. Because in Indian country, in the fight against the fossil fuel barons, in the fight against the oil and gas industry, the coal industry, you know, in every community that I've worked in in the 15 plus years I've been campaigning, it's always grandmas and moms that are the ones that are saying, hey, we need your help to come in. You know, whatever NGO I was working with, it's always grandmas and moms because they're concerned about their kids not having clean water. You know, they're concerned about, you know, their families not being able to continue to hunt, fish and trap. And, you know, I think what I don't know more represents, you know, is, is this glimmer, you know, this glimmer of the future that is actually right here, right now this unraveling of the inevitability narrative that capitalists will have you believe that oil companies are somehow an essential part of our society and we just have to tolerate them. And this isn't true, you know? And for me, you know, when I seen I Don't Know More shut down every single highway, every single rain, railway line, you know, on December, whatever it was, 21st, 2012, you know, they shut down Trans-Canada, they shut down every train in the province of Ontario, and they shut down six border crossings to the United States, and they did it with only one single arrest. What? You know? And it cost this country's economy tens of millions of dollars, if not more. And I've seen the same kind of hope come from when I was watching here in Quebec, the young people. The young people who were like, wait a minute, you're not going to raise our tuition fees. And they mobilized, you know, over a year. They put half a million people on the streets, dethroned a three-term charade government. And that's not even the inspiring part to me. The part that was inspiring is that while they were fighting against tuition fees, they began to, you know, also message on the, against the austerity agenda. They began to shine a very bright social movement light on Plan North. A plan uh, that would bring in a renaissance of mining, mega hydro development, you know, mega forestry development in northern Quebec. A plan that would disproportionately impact the Cree and Innu people in those regions. Because whether it's Quebec or Alberta or British Columbia or where I live in Manitoba or in the Atlantic provinces, environmental racism in this country is very much a red and white issue. The majority of Canadians that live here, that you know, pay taxes, that vote, that you know, obey the laws, all live within 200 kilometers of the U.S.-Canada border, and the rest of the country is inhabited predominantly by Inuit, by Métis, and by First Nations peoples. And so when we lay a map of all the indigenous communities in this country, and we overlay that map with the most toxic and destructive industries, the oil and gas developments, tar sands, pipeline developments, mega hydro developments, they're all within kilometers of indigenous communities. And so when we talk about you know, changing the system and not the climate, in this country we have to talk about colonization. We have to talk... You know, many, many of our brave survivors of Canada's genocidal policy of Indian residential school, this is where they worked with the churches and they took our children away. For over a hundred years, they stole our kids to be put into church-run schools, you know, to educate the Indian out of the child, to quote one of our first prime ministers, who was uh, minister of Indian affairs at the time when they enacted the policy. You know, all those survivors that spoke to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, I, I take my hats off to them, you know. And we're living in a moment right now, a very historic moment in our country where we really have to get it right. Because you and me, we all have different ways of dealing with Canada's really intense, really violent colonial history. 
you know this is a separate colonial state there were no indian wars there was no conquering a first nations or in you with people there were internationally legally binding treaties that were signed for peace to share the land to quote the honor to show me in the two row wampum treaty you know two boats on a river going down the river in the same direction and not crossing each other's paths this is the spirit and intent of all of the agreements forged by our ancestors. But of course, those <laughs> agreements have not been met. You know, and indigenous peoples today still, you know, are, are, are in crisis. And neo-colonialism, you know, has reared its head. Only this time, it's not Jesuit priests in black robes coming into our communities, it's corporate CEOs in black suits coming into our communities. <laughs> and instead of saying, change the way you communicate to Creator to solve your problems, they're saying, change your relationship to the sacredness of Mother Earth by entering into the industrialization game. And it's, all, it's bullshit, you know? And we really, really need to work together. You know, we need to build. I work for 350.org. And you know, uh, similar to my brother here, I, I, I'm really, really into civil disobedience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it works. You know, I was one of the first campaigners that started working on the issue of tar sands when it became an issue of concern for NGOs. You know, indigenous peoples in northern Alberta and the Athabasca region have been campaigning on tar sands for three or four decades. And it was only about, you know, 10 years ago that the nonprofit industrial complex decided to get involved. And I was one of those people that got involved. And at the time, it was a small group, really one family from Fort Chippewan that said, we got to do something about the tar sands. And we started to organize and we started to organize and we started, you know, we organize, 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 mobilize, organize, 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 mobilize, organize, mobilize, organize. <laughs> And we built up one of the most visible environmental, indigenous rights, intersectional campaigns ever in the history of campaigns. And we've had a lot of victories in the campaign, for sure. A lot, we've won a lot of battles. I think the most notable battle that we won was convincing and pushing the highest office in the United States government, the most powerful military superpower on the planet, to say no to big oil for the first time in the name of climate change. Yeah. the Northern Statement of the Keystone XL Pipeline. But we haven't stopped there, you know? We haven't stopped there. We still have half a dozen other pipeline proposals that sit on the table. We have the oil by rail fiasco still, you know, continuing. We have, you know, proposals like the tech mine in the tar sands. This is a mine that if it's approved, will be as big as all of the other surface mining operations combined, okay? It'll have its own dedicated tailings ponds. There's already, 13 tailings or 12 tailings ponds in the tar sands that are so big, you can see these things from outer space. If one of these tailings ponds were to burst into the Athabasca River, it would foul a third, okay, a third of Canada's freshwater resources. And remember, Canada has, what, two-thirds of the world's freshwater resources here? And so this is psychotic. This is, this is, this is psychotic Western scientific industrial experiment called Canada. But I wanted to go back to the National Creek Gathering and just kind of conclude my time so that we can get to talking back and forth because I'm always much more interested in what audiences want to know versus guessing what you want to know. But, you know, when I went, when I went to the National Creek Gathering, you know, it was an awesome thing. My kids running around, everybody speaking Cree and jigging everywhere, and, you know, it's real cool. But, uh, one of the things that, that kind of left me with a somber note was one of the old people, when we were sitting there at the end of the gathering, they brought out Big Bear's pipe and all the old people were saying their, their things. And one of the old people from Alberta, he, he gave a prescription to everybody. He said, you know, you gotta hang these colors, you know, and he said some colors, some cloth in your car and in your homes. And it was a prescription to protect your, your house and your vehicle from tornadoes. Think about that. You know? And in southern Manitoba, we've had a number of tornadoes in the last few weeks you know, that have hit First Nations. That, uh, you know, we've, been, we've been fortunate. There hasn't been a lot of, a lot, I don't think there's been deaths yet. But 
You know, the, even the old people are talking about, they're prescribing, you know, medicine now, you know, for protection because of our changing climate. That's how real this stuff is. And I would say that, you know, we have a big responsibilities on our shoulders living in this country that they call Canada. You know, this tar sands is one of about three carbon pools on the planet. You know, there's the Aronco tar belt in Venezuela, there's the coal seams in Australia, and then there's ours, the tar sands. And if just one of these coal, uh, one of these carbon pools is developed, it's game over for everybody. We'll lose our ability to, to live on the planet because of the changing climate that it'll create. And so we have a big weight on our shoulders, you know, but we can't get frozen by that, you know. There are solutions and answers, and a lot of those solutions and answers to solving the global climate crisis lie with the traditional knowledge that indigenous peoples have. In Paris, many of our indigenous peoples, they, they gathered there, you know, they gathered there, and, and, and the governments of the world recognized the vital and important role of indigenous knowledge in mitigating and adapting to climate change, you know. But the Paris Agreement, and I'm not as uh, as kind as, as, as my colleagues here on the panel, you know, the Paris Agreement is nothing more than another dirty trade deal, okay? It's a trade agreement. It's a trade agreement designed to commodify uh, what's, what they haven't commodified, and that's nature itself. They're commodifying the Earth's atmospheric carbon cycling capacity to process carbon dioxide. They are commodifying the very forests in the south, and countries like Canada are relying on these market-based mechanisms that Paris lifts up to buy their way out of compliance. Oh, we planted a million trees in Brazil, palm oil trees. We burnt the forest down there and moved the indigenous peoples out of the way first. And then we planted a million palm trees. So we're going to expand the tar sands because that's going to we'll get the carbon credits and it's all good. You know, that's what they're doing when they talk about the green economy. And so my challenge to all of you is that educate yourself on the complexities about this. You know, when we talk about climate change here in Canada, we have to talk about colonization. We have to talk about reconciliation. Because fundamentally, this country's economy is based on the, the marginalization of indigenous peoples, the suppression of our collective rights, and the dispossession of our peoples from land. Okay, so that they can give open door access to multinational corporations to come in and extract those resources and sell them to the highest bidder on the international market. And so, when we talk about climate change, we have to talk about reconciliation. We have to talk about healing the wounds of the past. We have to talk about a new way of thinking, a new way of planning, learning from our past, preparing in our present to defend our collective future. And I think that this, this movement right now, you know, against the fossil fuel barons, you know, this is about giving our young people and our children yet to be born the in movement infrastructure that they need to fight the next big war, which is going to be to defend the sacredness of water. And my concluding statement would be, you know, some of our women, they just gathered on the Great Lakes, uh, the Great Lakes Water Gathering. Uh, one of our noted artists and community leaders, Christy Belcourt, was was one of the people that convened that together. And they came out with a declaration from the grandmothers on how to defend and how to protect our water that are based on original instructions that we receive as the first people of these lands given to us by Kishi Manitou. I encourage you to Google that and to look at that declaration, you know, and to talk to your children about it, about the sacredness of water, the sacredness of the place where you call home. Know who your first people neighbors are. This process of decolonization is a responsibility that we all carry and we have to get it right because there's an even bigger fight coming after we've kicked big oil out of the picture and that's the fight against the privatization and commodification of the sacred uh, element of water. I'll leave it at that.
Thank you, Clayton, for this inspiring speech. Merci, Clayton, pour cette présentation des plus inspirantes. Nous allons passer à la période de questions du public. Alors, je vous prie, ceux qui ont des questions à poser, allez au micro. We'll entertain some questions from the public. I'll try and take a couple of questions and then have the panel answer. So please, those who have any questions, get to the microphone and I hope I can see. Yeah. There's a microphone there and there's another one here. Okay, monsieur, à la chemise bleue. Here. Um, what uh, please, would you be kind enough to keep your comments or questions fairly short so we get as many people? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Wachia, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is what we're talking about uh, is the issue of uh, uh, inequality and global, uh, and global change. Uh, what we're having today is uh, a huge migration of rich people from the north who are buying homes in the south. Basically, uh, holiday homes or second homes in, the, in, in Costa Rica, Ecuador, who are basically displacing, displacing native peoples around the coastlines of all these regions, as well as in uh, Aboriginal peoples in Indonesia or Thailand, whatever. And uh, this is creating a situation where we in the west, we in the north, must be able to combat by saying, first, if you're making, let's say, what is it? Uh, you're a policeman, you're making $200,000 a year. You're a, you're a fireman, you're making $100,000. You can't simply just go there and buy your five million, you know, comparatively speaking, huge mansions over there and displace all these people and force them into poverty and favelas. We here in the North must have a movement to basically support the indigenous peoples and the peasants. Well, if you listen, you, you'll find out what the question is. Sir, yeah. And, well, the question is, what should we be doing in order to basically uh, um, support the native peoples and the and the poor people of Latin America uh, in the, around the coastlines against the so-called colonization of whites? White people, northern white people who are buying homes there in order to, you know, for, for, for convenience, for cheap, for cheapness. Thank you very much. Nous allons prendre une autre question. Je vais passer à l'autre micro. Alors, je vous prie, gardez vos remarques assez brèves. Yes. Uh, a lot of people are not aware that Justin Trudeau's uh, family fortune comes from oil, and he has an extended family, and his wife comes from a very powerful stockbroker family. So obviously, he has a tremendous, tremendous interest in the oil industry. And he had the absolute profit from it. And a lot of people are not aware of that. Another problem is that the human organizations in Quebec and in Canada, the unions, the FDQ, the CSN, the hotel and restaurant workers, are influenced and controlled by the mafia. And even the premier, the former premier, was involved with the mafia. So you have these powerful human organizations that are controlled and influenced by the mafia. What are you going to do? You have the teachers in the United States, the construction union in the United States, which are all owned and, and influenced by the mafia. Also, the hotel and restaurant workers, which are over a million members in the United States, which are influenced by the mafia. Do you have a question? The, the question is, we have these powerful union, these human organizations that are supposed to be changing. What are you going to be doing when you're forming like petty organizations? Thank you very much. Nous allons prendre une autre question à notre micro, puis après nous revenons au, à nos invités. Oui. I want to thank the panel very much for an extraordinarily inspiring, inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, in the spirit of the uh, efforts of this panel of bringing all the struggles together, uh, the journal that I work with, Socialism and Democracy, has for the last year been working, especially for this occasion, on a special issue called the energy transition. So we have copies of it, which are on sale just outside, $10 for over uh, 200 pages of, Sir, uh, which as a, as, a, as a study guide. So just the announcement, thank, thank, you. thank you. Please, I'd like to have the woman come first to the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On vient du Brésil et on vient du Brésil dans un moment très inquiétant parce qu'on vient de souffrir un coup d'État. Et au Brésil, on a plusieurs plateformes démocratiques pour dénoncer la question de l'environnement 
et dénoncer les crimes qui sont commis contre les Premières Nations Brésil. Alors, on voudrait euh, savoir comment les panélistes euh, envisagent notre lutte pour la démocratie et pour mettre les combattre euh, pour euh, les droits des les Premières Nations. Comment vous euh, voyez les mouvements populaires au Brésil et comment on peut utiliser des autres outils de mobilisation parce que la démocratie au Brésil est finie. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. carbon footprint, I thought I should come and bring the greetings of the displaced people from Bangladesh due to climate uh, change and including the Royal Bengal Tigers who are going to be replaced or displaced because of a power plant in the Shundavans, which is the biggest mangrove. We would like to hear from the panel how you are linking up with the movements and civil dis uh, discipline uh, disobedience in our parts of the world where we are having real difficulty to stop our government because it talks about poverty and uh, energy poverty and then we have powerful neighbors and corporates and Indian company come and uh, are building uh, a power plant in the Sundarbans. There is no second Sundarbans. So if you don't act now, we won't be able to create another Sundarbans. We would like to hear whether you are in solidarity and in the north, are you taking up these cases or is it only going to be a focus on terrorism and how many women in Islam are wearing hijabs? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to go with the with the Brazilians with my half Brazilian heart I should have said Fora Terme Fora Terme because what is happening in Brazil is completely related to energy too. Yes. This is about the control of Petrograd and all this yes. the code that we cannot understand what is happening in Brazil if we don't understand that those corrupt people in the government, they not only want to cover their asses, but they want to take control of Petrobras. But they will not be able to do it because the people in Brazil are resistant and because we need to continue denouncing the cop, the coup d'etat in Brazil all Thank over the so world. There are problems in unions. It's not paradise. Of course, they are, they are, we are as trade unions, we are facing lots of problems, and uh, but there is also a union renewal. And when unions take a new agenda, is because they know that if we don't work with the informal uh, work, uh, work in the informal economy with migrants, if we don't renew the union structures and work on the new agendas like uh, uh, climate change and other issues unions are going to disappear, or are going to be in the mm -hmm. history books as this was a very important institution. But we are still, we need trade unions to defend the working condition, and we need trade unions to work with others because there are still jobs to defend, to be defended. And without trade unions, and saying that everything, all trade unions are the same, it, I'm sorry, but that is a very big mistake. Not trade, not all trade unions are the same. Thank you. Would you like to make a comment? There's a mic right there. No? Yep. I just wanted to quickly speak to the uh, question of the comrade from, from Bangladesh. Um, and also praise 350 in the process. Um, Endigalen, the, the, the campaign I mentioned that I, I was involved in last year and this year was only one part of a broader broader global campaign called Break Free from Fossil Fuels, which was initiated, not exclusively by Free, but initiated and led by 350, where the idea was that because we know that whatever, or we knew in advance that whatever would happen in Paris would be irrelevant and or crap, and it has in fact turned out to be good, um, we decided that we need to create our movement society to create our own globality, our own global effect, our own capacity to produce effects at the global level. So breakthrough from fossil fuels involved 
folks taking direct action against fossil fuels and for a renewable energy transition in the Philippines, in Canada, in Brazil, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Indonesia. I don't think in Bangladesh, but we're also not stopping with these kind of campaigns. And so what I can say now here is that we should talk later on, we should get in touch. And the next time we do break free from fossil fuels, because we'll continue doing it, we will be involving your struggle because we stand in solidarity with all the struggles and all the fuels and for the new energy transition. And this one quick question, um, because I will also at some point be an older white man, um, <laughs> saying something and then asking, do you agree, does not constitute a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to express my, my unwavering and undying support uh, for my sister who just spoke up from Bangladesh. Um, you know, Tazio listed out what the organization I work for, you know, has been promoting and supporting as far as fossil fuel fights around the world. Um, but by all means, you know, uh, I don't know uh, about any, any connections here in Canada directly between indigenous peoples fighting against the tar sands of the pipelines and, and the group that you talked about. But certainly, you know, let's communicate, and uh, you know, if there's ways that we can we can help out, if there are corporate offices here in North America that we can target, um, you know, there are many different social movement crews um, that that contact us here in the activist community in Canada, mostly the mining sector, because 86% of the mining companies around the planet are based here and publicly traded in the Toronto Stock Exchange. But certainly, you know, we're always looking for those creative ways to do. Uh, shareholder activism to like embarrass them in their own yard, you know, those kinds of things, you know, or if there's like financiers of the project that are based here, there's many different creative ways that we can collaborate and build power in a good way. And so, you know, for sure. But of course, as far as the solidarity piece, hell yeah. Um, to my sisters from uh, Brazil, I totally 100% stand with y'all in a really good way. And, you know, big shout out to everybody in Brazil being affected by the world's biggest uh, real estate grab, the Olympics. You know, the Olympics, that shit's got to end. Um, you know, Brazil, like Canada, likes to redwash its image with in, the, the, the imagery of indigenous peoples, you know. And, and, you know, whenever I go to Brazil, I always hear about how, like, oh, there's no racism in Brazil. But no, it's like really racist against indigenous peoples in Brazil and black folks. And, um, you know, so for me, I just wanted to say that, that you know, um, there are connections between our people. We're collaborating particularly on the big agricorp and on the privatization of forests in Brazil through the World Bank REDS program. You know, it's programs like the World Bank Red program, which are privatizing forests in the south that provide a laundering mechanism for fossil fuel polluters in the north to, 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 to uh, um, launder their carbon pollution and actually expand the fossil fuel regime in the north. And when they do that up here, that affects indigenous peoples because they're operating in our homelands. So the connection of solidarity between you know, indigenous peoples living in the Amazon who are, um, you know, there's these carbon brokers all over Brazil who are like, sell us your trees, sell us your trees, sell us your trees. We're gonna pay you to take care of the forest. You know, they're doing that on behalf of G8 economies who are investors in the World Bank, you know, and the World Bank controls the International Carbon Trading Facility. And, you know, the legacy of uh, World Bank initiatives are horrific. You know, the Clean Development Mechanism, which predates REDS, um, you know, I mean, they killed indigenous peoples for that because the World Bank has no indigenous safeguards policy. In many countries they finance for energy projects don't have indigenous policies. And so indigenous peoples end up being the ones who are removed from the land in the name of development. And so, you know, um, I, I definitely encourage you to, you know, contact me and I can put you in touch with folks, um, you know, up here who are working with groups in, in Brazil and different different parts of Brazil and Acre and different areas and, you know, for sure connect, so. Thank you. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I'm, a, I, I also am on the board of 350, and I think that Break Free this year um, was uh, a really important precedent for really showing that this is a global movement, right? To have this month of coordinated actions uh, with actions around the world, including in Bangladesh. Um, but, you know, but, 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 I, but when I look back at the 15-year cycle 
of the social forum. I, I don't believe we're actually as linked internationally as we used to be. And it's a funny thing because we all spend so much time staring at our phones and connecting and it's never been easier to connect. But in a weird way, I can only speak for Canada, we are more inward looking than we've been in a, a long time. You know, we, we beat the FTA because we had a movement that was that, that reached from you know Alaska to Tierra del Fuego and, and we coordinated that together. And we haven't built that yet for the TPP. You know, we've barely built it with Europe to fight CETA. So like, what, something weird is happening, um, and it's, it's all the more reason why we need a transnational progressive movement. You know, also because we see what happens in countries like Greece when a single government tries to take on these transnational powers. It's, it, it, it has to be done in cooperation. You know, and, and you know, when I look back at you know these 15 years it, it, and think about that first world social forum, and um, you know, it, it was the beginning of a cycle, right? I mean, this was pre-PT victory, this was pre-Morales' victory, pre-Correa's victory, pre the whole so-called pink tie, right? Um, Pre-Syriza, pre-Podemos. So there's been a lot that's happened, um, but you know, the shadow that is over this gathering is not only. The, 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 the denial of visas. It's also that Brazil gave birth to the World Social Forum. And after that first social forum, that's, that's where I first saw Lula da Silva um, rile up a crowd like nobody's business. He was on a campaign trail and he won as president, made history. Um, and here we are, 15 years later, having this forum, not only with uh, so many delegates from the Global South denied visas, but with Brazil uh, uh, under a coup d'etat. Yeah. Um, so these are serious, serious times, but it's also you know, all the more reason to remember that you know, we can, when we organize, we can win. You know, I was listening to Clay talking about, the, you know, I, I didn't even know about the Tar Sands until I met Clay. It's embarrassing, but it was shocking how many Canadians didn't know what was going on in the Tar Sands 10 years ago in our own country. And, I remember meeting Tom Goldtooth at the World Social Forum in the car, and he said, in a very understated Tom way, well, there are these arteries, there are these pipelines, and we're going to give it, them a heart attack. <laughs> and we're going to block all the arteries to the tar sands. And, you know, and, 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 and this has been happening. And this is why uh, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, this is why this movement is facing a real fight back, incredible public relations counter strategy. That's why Bill McKibben, the founder of 350, is being followed around by guys with cameras absolutely everywhere he goes. Um, he has very own trackers, as if he's a politician running for president. Um, and we also know uh, that in the global south, people who fight to protect the earth face more than cameras pointed at them. They face guns. Um, and so, you know, this, um, you know, this space that we have is incredibly important, and it's flawed and it's frustrating. But let's make the most of it. Let's make the most of the time we have together. Enfin, la majorité des, des sièges sociaux des, des, des minières et de l'industrie euh, pétrolière se trouve ici au Canada. Il faut rappeler très fortement que le Canada est un paradis fiscal pour ce, ce secteur d'activité-là. Et je pense qu'il y a toute euh, une responsabilité de la, de la part du Canada et des Canadiens à, à, à faire en sorte que ce, soit, que ce ne soit plus le cas pour que justement euh, ces compagnies puissent être après poursuivies. Euh, en l'état actuel des choses pour les actions qu'elles peuvent faire à, à, à l'étranger, notamment ça. Et de façon plus générale, lutter contre les paradis fiscaux, de toute façon, euh, me semble non seulement nécessaire, mais indispensable. Merci à vous. Nous allons revenir à la question. Please keep your remarks short so we can have as many people to the mic as possible. I would still like to thank you for the brilliantly both vitamins and colors in the of this presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, because the second part of the comment is more to a critique. I think that you uh, you forgot the, the key issue that perhaps Naomi who got very close to it. And it's very simple. Carbon budget. 
there's one factor that's going to determine the future is how much carbon is in the atmosphere. And we forgot this, the importance of this as a political tool. If we ask Justin Trudeau a question for whose answer is, is a number, he's, he's done. The question is very simple. How many tons do you want to burn? And we want an answer, uh, uh, a number for an answer. He was going to have to, the uh, uh, one is going to have to show his, uh, his colors, his true colors. Uh, and voila, that's uh, how good for that is. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to set the right by that. You will we, 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 let's see. Hello, I'm Kaina Jordan from Make Votes Matter, the UK campaign for proportional representation. And I want to point out that, as you're probably very well aware, we have a democratic crisis. And a lot of the greatest environmental, social, and economic injustices in the world are led by countries that have false um, democracies. So countries like Canada, like the USA, uh, UK, and Australia all have first past the post. And this results in minority governments where less than, like in, in the UK, less than a quarter of the electorate voted for our government. And the majority don't want them. Until we fix this, and until we have people really in power, we can't solve the challenge of climate change. And there are amazing movements happening in countries all over the world, including Canada, the really inspiring movement for proportional representation here with organizations like Fair Vote Canada. And I'd like to know um, what all of you are doing or would like to do to support those efforts for real democracy to help us get change we need to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you. My question is uh, regarding the cultural transformation that is required in order to uh, facilitate the, the systemic change that you're talking about. I think Naomi referred to it. I think it seems to me that the, the deep manifesto tries to speak, speak to that, to the, the production of a, a different vision. So my question relates to the work based on your experiences that, that is required, in my view, not just to produce a vision, to have a, it's important not to have a vision, but have processes of visioning so that the, the so that there is so that we can wield the power people of the power that people are buying to that that vision uh, so my question is to based on your experiences and what you you've seen uh, the kinds of work that gone into because I, I've worked as a, a teacher at a college uh, teaching anti-capitalism for uh, 15 years and it's, it's frustrating right it's very frustrating because you see that we can talk about movement but the cult the, the work that is required to create a cultural movement so that we, we create the, 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 the necessary conditions so that that transformation, the material, the, 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 the transformation production, but the cultural transformation that also happens. I would, I would like to hear uh, your experiences and your thoughts on the work that's required. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more comment from the lady, Madame. Yes, I'm uh, Maitha. I'm from the Kurdish Women's Movement. I want to bring you all solidarity and greetings uh, from Rojava and all over Kurdistan. As you can see in my person, uh, we're an internationalist movement. Uh, and uh, we also have border problems, but not in Canada, but uh, in Rojava, so our delegation uh, from Rojava could not come. Um, I myself stayed a long time in Rojava, so they asked me to come here because as a German passport, yes, you know the problem. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the, the trying to isolate the uh, revolution of Rojava uh, for, uh, from the world, I think is a very big problem that we have to talk about. And I think it's also a little bit uh, the question of this panel, uh, what we see, uh, uh, what we have to discuss also uh, as movements. Because I think, uh, and this is the philosophy that we have uh, in our self-defense groups, uh, which uh, did the big failure, uh, the big, uh, uh, not failure, uh, I'm thinking in Kurdish, it's sometimes difficult uh, to talk in English. Uh, so, uh, the big... Uh, no, just a second. <laughs> um, so, the, so the big, uh, the big uh, 